Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chris Anthony Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today's episode is based on minutes 111 through 115 of episode 8, The Last Jedi. This is the climax of the film, when three separate subplots come to a head. Rey and Kylo are caught in a strenuous force tug of war with Luke's old lightsaber, suspended in the air between them. Meanwhile, Vice Admiral Holdo sets the Radis for hyperspace, aiming her ship directly at the Supremacy. Then as the lightsaber between Kylo and Rey breaks into pieces, Holdo's ship makes the jump into hyperspace and rams into the Supremacy, splitting that massive dreadnought in half and thus sacrificing herself. This, in turn, interrupts the execution of Finn and Rose, and then Finn ends up dueling with Captain Phasma amidst all the wreckage and ultimately kicks her to a fiery death. All of this is cross-cut, and this happens in the span of two minutes. Musically, we are in for a treat. Here's a refresher. That end part is when the track ends and we get the moment of silence as the dreadnought splits in half and, you know, that whole thing. But that's that's where that ends. Okay. What did I just play? Well, it's not on the commercial soundtrack, but if you get your hands on a four-year consideration complete The Last Jedi soundtrack album, or you can find it on YouTube, look for a track called Holdo's Resolve because you can find that complete cue on that track. It's really stunning and it features the desperation motif which we have which I have mentioned a few times on the show but not in very much detail. More so we have talked about something called the tension motif and in this episode I'm going to show you how those two motifs are related and in fact how the desperation motif sort of sprung forth from the innocuous tension motif like a theme spawning from midichlorians sort of <laughs> okay forget that analogy but what is really going on here first let's do a very a very basic first let's do like a basic listen and narration of what is happening in this say 30 to 60 seconds of music without the need for too much analysis like i think these are things that are are apparent the first time you listen or now that i've mentioned them that anyone could really listen to it and notice these. And what I'm talking about is the key changes. So you may have noticed that I started in one key, A minor, and then it went up to C sharp minor. If you're watching the film while listening to that, or if you're watching the film so the music is already there, you might notice that when there is a cross cut, to another angle of this, you know, triplot scene sequence. Uh, basically, with every escalation in key, there's sort of an escalation in the action. So that's a very standard way of applying key changes to a sequence. And here, it's done, of course, to great effect. Um, it starts with A minor, with Holdo sort of positioning the ship, and then. And then as we cross cut visually to Kylo and Rey pulling the lightsaber with the force, we go to the next key. And finally, as we get to Holdo's face, we see her lean back and then we cut back to them again, grunting even more. And when Phasma says execute, this is when we are now all the way up into the final key, which is E minor. And then, of course, that's where the piece ends. Uh, 
Okay, so that's one way of looking at it is the escalating keys as the tension is escalating. And that's great. But I think we can go a little bit deeper than that. And that's what we're going to do in this episode. We're going to peel back a couple more layers of this motif. And in fact, trace this desperation motif all the way back to the beginning of the film, the tension motif. To be technical, you can actually trace it all the way back to The Force Awakens when this innocuous little that sort of motif, that sort of figure with these four notes, which would be called like scale degree one, two, three, four. You can trace that back to The Force Awakens, but it's so, you know, blink and you miss it that many people missed it, including myself, until going through the film five minutes at a time. So uh, it, this is a, a discovery process that we've been undergoing together, really, because I did not have this insight and foresight when I started this podcast and was just at the beginning of the film. Okay. The reason I was actually inspired to do this episode and to bring these concepts to you, the audience, is that I watched a talk by Frank Lehman called Thematic Transformation and the Limitations of Leitmotivic Analysis. And I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but it gets quite technical, so I'm going to distill uh, the parts that I think are salient here and that I think uh, will be meaningful to a broader audience. But one part that really struck me in that talk was that he brings up a common critique that scholars make regarding John Williams. And I think it is one that I hear very often, and it's one that you may have heard as well. The critique is that nothing really happens with the themes in Star Wars. In other words, the themes pretty much stay the same. The motifs don't transform a whole lot, other than in pretty basic ways. It's a pretty stagnant score. Of course, you know, that is a very harsh judgment, or, or it's it's a very black and white sounding judgment, but boil it down to like the gist of it, you know? In episode eight, when we hear the force theme, it's still pretty preserved from the f first time we hear it in episode one. It's not like the themes are so warped by episode eight that we don't even recognize them anymore. And that's mainly what that critique is about. It's not about the scores not being good or, you know, impactful. It's more so about whether or not there is much development of the individual leitmotifs. So that is a critique that many scholars make. But as Lehman pointed out in the video, and again, it's in the show notes, this both is and isn't true, and that a pitfall that a lot of scholars fall into is analyzing and considering these themes in their idealized states rather than investigating how they behave in underscore. Lo and behold, um, you know, my, my ears perked up when I heard that or when I watched that because that is uh, basically, that's basically what this show does, Star Wars Music Minute. You know, we're going through the films five minutes at a time. And so we're, we're, we're getting more underscore than not, I'd say. And as I mentioned before, Holdo's Resolve is not even on the commercial soundtrack. So this would be an easy thing to miss unless you're actually watching the movie. All right. So let's get into how this applies to the desperation motif, because really, 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 this, something really, really cool happens with this motif. Um, but before we get into exactly that, I do want to go over how motifs are normally used in Star Wars, so that when I talk about how the desperation motif developed, it feels more special because we'll have you know a shared understanding of what the norm is, so that it will stand out. So motifs in Star Wars are often used quotationally or citationally. For example, you could put a quote of the Imperial March here and there, and oftentimes it's a pretty direct quote. I mean, it's not copy-pasted literally from a digital audio workstation like you might in a Word document, like you might copy-paste one chapter or one paragraph to another, but it is, you know, very... Uh, it's fairly unchanged. And that brings me to the second thing. And I don't know, I made up this analogy and it, maybe it makes sense only to me, but to me, it's sort of fairly immortal. Like it's one of those ingredients that sort of stays on your shelf and you can pull it out when you need to use it, but it stays relatively intact. It's like, you know, in a salt shaker, it's like a shelf stable 
ingredient that you can just sprinkle out um, when you need it. And even if you transform it, like you turn the salt or, you know, the sauce into something else, you can still put the jar back on the shelf and it's still uh, pretty pure for the next time you need to use it. So I'll get into specifics of these analogies in a second. And last but not least, another way of saying the same thing, there's very little transformation. And if there is transformation, it's relatively basic. Now, this is not to say at all that the themes remain exactly, exactly the same, but, and because, uh, you know, names like basic and um, simple transformation sound a little bit subjective and are somewhat, sub you know, it's subjective what constitutes a basic transformation as opposed to a more developed transformation. Despite this subjectivity, there are formal elements that we can actually look at and we can observe what is simply more commonly done versus what is less commonly done. Common types of leitmotivic, you know, thematic transformation include Actually, let me let me play, let me use Twinkle Twinkle as an example of a light motif. Okay? So <laughs> bear with me. Okay, so that's a light motif a lot of people recognize. A common type of transformation applied to Twinkle Twinkle could be ornamentation. That is one way that motifs are commonly adorned. And that would be literally listen for like when I add bells and whistles to it. kind of a sad example, but I think you get the point. It's like adding little, little, they're called ornaments in music. You just add little bells and whistles to the main melody, but this melody still stays the same. This would be like trills, things like appoggiaturas or turns or, uh, you know, little passing notes. Another common type of transformation would be simply switching up the orchestration or the arrangement. So if I were to take out my violin right now, I could play Twinkle Twinkle on the violin and you would still recognize it as being Twinkle Twinkle, but instead of on the piano, it would be on the violin. And then you could further transform that, you know, you could transform that in a different way by having a brass choir play that. You could even, you know, do it on the piano an octave lower and with um, sort of different types of um, accompaniment. Like you could Another way, I'm not going to go through all the ways, but these are just common ways that you might recognize throughout Star Wars, um, is you could switch up the rhythm and the time elements. And we've talked about this um, with Ray's theme. We've talked about this in, w in relationship to many themes, actually. And that would be things like um, Ray's theme, norm or that would be things like I made it faster, I made the meter in sort of a three instead of a four, um, things like that. They're sort of basic. You could even change the key. These are all basic ways of transforming a light motif. But here's what happens in The Last Jedi with the desperation motif. This is how the desperation motif spawned from a small seed up into what it is in these minutes. Well, actually, before I get to that, sorry, <laughs> sorry to keep stopping myself, but I do want to explain um, a little bit more of what the opposite of a basic uh, type of transformation is. Not the opposite, but beyond that, what are some other ways? Um, that one could transform a theme in a more so-called advanced or, or sort of a more, I don't know, profound way or a more, you know, just 
a more advanced way. In the talk, Frank Lehman points out things like um, light motivic family networks, tonal motivicism, concealed repetition, motivic deconstruction and reconstruction. You don't need to know any of these terms, and I'm not going to lie, there are some of them that I had to look up. Okay, one of them that he also mentions is contrapuntal inter interpenetration, and I just straight up, my music degree did not send me off into the world with that knowledge. But the last thing that he uh, that he cites, and that um, I don't think he came up with, you know, these types of thematic transformation. There's a long history of you know scholars that have come before him, and there's a lot of links um, cited in the show notes to the you know pa various papers and things that I read as well. But the last one is teleological genesis. And that is the one that we're going to dive into today because teleological genesis, and I swear this will make sense to you in about five minutes, is something that is used in the desperation motif and is rarely used in Star Wars and in films. So it's very, it, it's very exciting. I find it pretty exciting. Um, and I will note that John Williams does use the other types of so-called so advanced thematic transformation in other parts of Star Wars. Um, but it's the teleological genesis, one that I'm about to get into in relationship to the desperation motif that is just less, less used. Hence exciting. So what is teleological genesis? <laughs> I know it's like such a, the phrase of it is just a little bit, um, can be a little intimidating. So teleological genesis involves the emergence of an extended melodic idea, like the desperation motif, that develops gradually from mere fragments, like the tension motif. These fragments start out humbly and evolve until their final culmination. I adapted that definition from James Hebikoski, again, linked to all my sources in the show notes. But basically, here are the main points. There are humble beginnings, The theme seems to spring from nowhere. So, you know, this is one that I said that I had not really even noticed. And then when it really blooms, it turns out those seeds had been planted all along. So that's important in teleological genesis. I mean, sorry. Yeah, in teleological genesis. Also, the motif undergoes a bunch of evolutions. And they're called rotations. These rotations can be thought of as stages of metamorphosis, um, it's a generative process. It's constantly developing and changing as it comes into contact with other themes or is pushed to develop by other, you know, tension in the narrative. But the point is, it's not like the other type of leitmotif that I mentioned before where when you use it and transform it, you still put it back on the shelf untouched. This is different because it's like when the motif starts to evolve, it sort of keeps evolving from there. Um, so that is important. And last but not least, there is an end point. There is a final iteration of this theme. And that's what we get in Holdo's Resolve. There is an end point to this theme. So once it has blossomed, it reaches sort of... A, I think what's called like a telic end point, like a, a telic theme. And telic just meaning coming from the Greek word, you know, telos, end. Um, it just means the final moment of it. And then it's over. And it never comes back again. So again, we start with the tension motif. It's humble. You could miss it. And then it sort of develops and develops over the course of the film. And the way it develops is, you know, maybe it'll change rhythms. Um, Oh, and then it comes into contact with like March of the Resistance. And we also hear it like. And there you'll notice that a note is changed. I won't go into too many details because I think this might be hard to hear. But just, um, you know, if you know, it, if you know what this means, just know that like it, there is a point in which the tension theme uh, incorporates a fifth scale degree instead of a fourth. So this would be the fourth scale degree. You can 
tune out for 30 seconds if you don't understand this. But then it also goes to. And the fully fledged aspiration motif does have that fifth scale degree. So you can watch the lecture if you want to see sort of more of the transformations, more of the rotations that it goes through. But suffice to say, it, you know, he makes a great case for the fact that it does undergo this transformation. And then I think um, in Holda's Resolve, since we hear the tension motif immediately preceding the desperation motif, there is a pretty uh, well-established connection between the two of them, and one leads to the other. And it sort of is this beautiful moment of like being able to see a summary of the evolution all within 60 seconds. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Anyway, and the last thing, which I think is very interesting, especially for Star Wars, is that this motif satisfies the so-called you know, end requirement of the fact that it is telic, like it doesn't happen again. This is rare with Star Wars. Normally when we get a motif, I mean, that really becomes sort of part of the library of motifs that are used henceforth, not only by John Williams, but in other themes and in the cartoons and even, you know, other composers. Force theme, it's not like the force theme burned out and fizzled, um, you know? So this one does not show up in The Rise of Skywalker it only shows up in The Last Jedi, the desperation motif, and moreover, it doesn't even show up in the third act of this very film. It ends here. Like what I just, that, that's where it ends. That's where the desperation motif ends. And I think that is so, I think that's so powerful. And I think this, um, it, I think this is a good, I think this is a good segue to some sort of philosophical questions. Um, because now that I've explained what's so interesting about the desperation motif and, you know, maybe is something that you might enjoy appreciating more when you watch it or, you know, now you might notice the tension motif as it builds up to it throughout the film if you rewatch The Last Jedi. But something that I think is really interesting is to actually think about why this hasn't happened much before. Moreover, what could have made the development of this special motif possible because it is really like a, a, a very special thing. It's a very cool thing that John Williams did here. And these are the questions that I've sort of been mulling over for the last few days. I'm going to bring up some of the questions um, that I've gotten and that I've been thinking about with regard to this. And a lot of this will be my own sort of my own guesswork and my own questions, not so much the definitive reasons. So, okay. Here's one thing I was thinking about. The original trilogy leitmotifs perhaps don't go as through as much transformation in the sequel trilogy because many of the characters they're associated with don't undergo much transformation in the sequel trilogy. I mean, not that they're not badass, like Leia is clearly, you know, a force to be reckoned with, but she sort of always was. And there's not like a profound difference in her theme, you know, at all from the first movie to this movie. I'd say the character that undergoes the most transformation in the sequel trilogy, or at least, you know, in this movie is Luke. But instead of altering like binary sunset, you know, the, or the main title, we actually get new distinct material for Luke. So that sort of does still satisfy, like it sort of preserves like the ability for new themes to represent new, um, you know, new musical themes to represent new character themes. Um, and that was done in a way that still preserved the old ones, which, you know, my headcanon way of explaining that could be that because, you know, Luke's going through all these changes, he needs something new for one. However, despite his personal turmoil, his legacy extends beyond him and he no longer is the sole like owner of his themes. Leia, I think, is still attached to Leia's theme. And, you know, Ray is attached to Ray's theme. But Luke, you know, he's not really attached to a specific theme anymore because his legacy has extended so far beyond that. And now the Force theme, 
is shared by so many. And the main title is just shared by, you know, it's such a broader concept of heroism and, and rebellion. And yeah, so to remind you, like Luke does get new themes in this film and it's the stuff that we hear on Octo. That's one of them. The other one is like do 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 Um it's the Luke in Exile um themes. So that is something that um you know I think is worth considering. Another thing is what would happen? What would happen if a beloved theme um burned out like a fireball and then disappeared? You know, what if Leia's theme underwent a significant transformation and resulted in a final form and then was never heard again. I think that's a practical concern and probably even more so than that. It thematically, you know, some of these old characters are so thematically tied to legacies that extend through the sequels and beyond that it would sort of be a little sacrilegious um, to many people. And I think practical considerations really do actually factor in to the reasons we might not hear this much in other films and in many uh, Star Wars scores. You know, people already are sort of freaking out about the Holdo maneuver and, and also just that like Admiral Akbar dies in this movie. And not to mention the fact that Luke dies in this movie. I think no, there's no, I can think of no better scenario in this film for there to be a theme that dies like goes down with the ship basically it's tied to admiral holdo and we never see her again and we never get the desperation motif again it's still really powerful and it works really well in my opinion but i feel like this was sort of a perfect scenario for john williams to take the care to actually develop a theme that undergoes transformations and and goes through this whole you know teleological genesis speculation. That's just some things that I've been thinking about. Um, let's see. Also, I don't know. Again, speculation. John Williams doesn't have like complete control over all the music of Star Wars. And so, you know, we've already heard the themes in other offshoot media. And most of these motifs have to bounce back and be put back on the shelf. Questions that I would ask John Williams if I ever spoke to him would be, like, did you know that there would be an only a score-only version of the film? Um, in, in case you didn't know, there is a score-only version of this film. You can access it on, I think, the DVD extras or on Disney+. Plus. And I wonder if he knew in advance and thus, you know, made some effort toward this little musical Easter egg, so to speak. I also am curious if just something about the film itself, like the way it was cut, the, you know, Ryan Johnson's work, if something about the material that he was scoring to was structured in a way that made this theme feel more, you know, inspired him basically, because it's not that composers, you know, I think it's a little bit of a fallacy to both blame and praise the composer, John Williams, for everything that goes on in the film because it really is, you know, a back and forth and it really is, the score is really a, a confluence of many factors and many decisions and many cuts and many desires from the director. And I don't know, maybe John Williams felt inspired in some way by the way that scene was, you know, so cross cut and sort of the whole nihilism and the whole like shattering of so many things and the moment of silence was also like the first of its kind in a Star Wars film maybe just the visceral destruction and you know the nothingness and maybe that scene inspired him I don't know these are just these are just potentials at the end of the day does this matter does it matter that John Williams you know put this really um rare for Star Wars, rare for film, motif in The Last Jedi? 
Does it matter? I mean, does anyone even notice? Now, this is the question that's just really been um, gnawing away at me <laughs> because I get excited about this, but I also know that it's not something that people notice, and I didn't even notice the first time. I certainly didn't. I didn't notice the first time I watched the film at all. No way. And so it sort of makes me think about bigger questions of what matters and what is worth even putting in art. Former guest of the show, Matt Berkey, asked me, would exciting transformation in the score take away from the visuals? And to that, I, I say, my opinion is that these transformations in the themes aren't necessarily exciting like on an immediate level, it's exciting music, but the, the ways that they're transforming are not viscerally exciting. I mean, le by all means, let me know in the comments if you did notice the full origin and blossoming of the desperation motif, but I didn't. Um, and so I would say probably not because the exciting transformation is not about the fact that it's an exciting transformation. It's more so that there's exciting music happening. If anything, I would consider these types of transformations more akin to musical Easter eggs. So not distracting if you don't notice, but potentially enriching if you do. The first instance of more so-called advanced thematic transformation that I ever noticed on my own was the deconstructed hint of Darth Vader that is present in young Anakin's theme in The Phantom Menace. And again, I'm sure that's not something that I realized as a kid watching The Phantom Menace in the theaters with my dad. I mean, I only watched it once in the theaters when I was a kid. And it's something that I only noticed with <laughs> by listening to the soundtrack on repeat for five hours a day the whole summer after the film came out because I happened to have this volunteering job where I was stuffing envelopes and wanted, didn't want to listen to people. So just through, you know, passively listening and letting that soundtrack seep into my ears did it you know strike me one day and I think that is sort of a, I think that's a sort of treasure um, I love those moments and it sort of it gives films and it gives scores rewatch and re-listen re um, value for me so that's sort of my tentative answer to what's the point because personally, I just find it delightful when music or books or, or films have, you know, a little bit of extra craft baked into them, even if it's not going to be noticed. I think that's still fine to put in there. And I still enjoy discovering new layers after many listens and many years. From the words of John Williams himself, I listened to an interview by Jim Shveda on KUSC, link in the show notes, um, with John Williams about The Last Jedi. And John Williams was talking about how light motif, light, light motifs and sort of light motivic writing is dwindling down and it makes sense because of new, just new styles of composing film music that are more atmospheric, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the point. The point is like, he was sort of talking about how it's so fun that Star Wars gets away with doing light motifs, which might be considered sort of cheesy in other franchises or like other movies, other standalone movies. And he said, and, and um, you know, I wrote down some quotes, and it, this is going to be skipping some details, but these are, this is the paraphrase. He says, in Star Wars, the swords come out. There are good guys and bad guys. They can all have their identifying motifs, and we actually get away with it. It's really fun to sling, in, sling these melodic things around in various modalities and orchestral settings and so on and so little tapestries with them. And then he says, probably the listener doesn't absorb all of it on the first hearing. But I think we have to believe that there's some unconscious process as we go through the audiovisual experience of it, that the themes wedded to the characters connects the audience in some way that they perhaps wouldn't if this technique were not used. And while that does, end of quote, while that does not, you know, necessarily specifically answer the question of like, why did you include te an instance of te teleological genesis in The Last Jedi if no one was going to notice it, it does sort of give me a hint that John Williams doesn't mind putting stuff in to his scores that even if people aren't going to absorb it because, you know, as he says, we have to believe that there's some sort of unconscious process. Now, whether or not this is true or whether or not that is true for everyone, um, you know, you can choose for yourself whether 
you find unconscious processes uh, salient in your life, but I would say I don't have evidence to rule against them in my life. So that, um, so that's that. To recap, uh, to recap what we talked about here, um, this set of five minutes is a really tremendous one for the Last Jedi and for the sequel trilogy and for Star Wars as a whole. It breaks ground in many ways, and musically, it is a real astounding case study, a really fascinating case study. Again, we have the fully formed desperation motif spawned via, you know, teleological genesis, which is this advanced leitmotivic transformation technique in which an innocuous motif, like the tension motif, undergoes transformations and then suddenly you start to notice it and it metamorphosizes into its final form like a butterfly and then like a butterfly it flies away it's done it's the final form there are no more rotations there are no more transformations and it leaves the nest I think I can't think of a more fitting a more symbolic type of theme or theme to go with this moment, this desperate moment of literally a, a ship going into light speed as it hits another ship in this like huge sacrificial moment. The theme is sacrifice too, along with it. And oh my gosh, I don't know whether any of that was intentional, but I guess we'll never know unless John Williams confirms or denies. But gosh, isn't it cool when that happens and, you know, when we can draw those connections? It sort of makes this whole scene even more rich of an experience for me. That's all I'm going to say for this episode. There's so much more I could have talked about in relation to these minutes of The Last Jedi. And we didn't even touch upon the striking sound design because, you know, the silence, the moment of silence when the radis breaks apart could be in itself like a whole other deep dive episode. But because this episode and this, uh, you know, has a, had a lot of potentially new information for a lot of people and um, just this really striking moment in the music, I, I wanted to give it some space. So I'm going to leave this episode a little bit more focused and and end it right here. But perhaps in the future, we can go back and investigate the sound design alone in this scene. I will also say that um, Frank Lehman will be on a future episode of this show. So if you have any questions for him, you can start um, sending them to me at Chrysanthitan on Twitter or at Star Wars Musemen on Twitter, or you could email me at podcast at Star Wars Music Minute.com. And also, I have a bunch of links in the show notes, you know, cited bibliography style to some of, if you want to know more about some of the things I was talking about and some of the, you know, musicologists that I referenced. And um, also I will put a link in the show notes to a Holdo's Resolve on YouTube. Um, thank you so much. We're almost at the end of the season. I hope this episode was interesting. Let me know if it was. And if you enjoy these occasional deep dri- deep dives, I sort of, I like, inter- I like um, switching the show up with more casual you know, nerding out and then with some more occasional deep dives into topics. So yeah, let me know in the comments on YouTube or, you know, all the social media places or um, let's see, there's also a link in the show notes if you prefer to submit an anonymous question. That's all I have for today. Thank you everyone. And I'll see you next week on Star Wars Music Minute.